Okay. All right. All right. All right, then. That's good. All right. Well, can you guys please give a word of life welcome to Reverend Barry Tubbs of Kenneth Copeland Ministries. What an honor it is to have him with us today. We're blessed to have you. We're so grateful. We're grateful you're here. Thank you. Good afternoon. That was weak. This is the day the Lord has made. Now, who did he make it for? You. Huh? I mean, the level of your faith is directly proportional to the level of your excitement. Huh? If you really believe. Now, listen. Yeah. I know y'all get the word here. I know you know about the promises. We just heard about some of the promises, uh, the financial promise. If you really believe that, wouldn't you get a little excited? Huh? Well, a few of you. What about the rest of you? You get excited about anything? Huh? Let me ask you something. Y'all heard of Publishers Clearinghouse, right? Hmm? See that deal on the TV? Right? If that guy showed up at your front door, now y'all may not see this down there in Australia, but anyway, we got this thing here, Publishers Clearinghouse, and they give away money, right? And so what they do is they show up at somebody's front door. This is an an ad on TV, right? So they show up at a front door, and somebody opens the door. Hello, you have won the Publishers Clearinghouse sweepstakes. And then they got this people standing out in the front yard with this massive check for a million dollars, right? Now, if that guy showed up at your front door, some of you would open the door and say, no, you must be looking for my neighbor. I never win anything. Huh? But then some of you would get excited. Huh? A million dollars. Huh? You'd jump and shout and run around the house and praise God, I can pay off the house, I can pay off the car, I can write a big check to the church. Huh? But let me ask you a question. Do you have any money? No, you don't have a dime. All you have is a promise from Publishers Clearinghouse that they're going to give you some money. Huh? Publishers Clearinghouse could go belly up tomorrow. But here you have promises from the Almighty God who created this heaven, the moon, the sun, the stars, this universe, who has never lied about anything and has more than enough to cover whatever your issues may be. Well, shouldn't we get just as excited about his promises as we do Publishers Clearinghouse? We should be. You know, we're, we're obligated to be prosperous. Hmm? Why? Because we are representatives of the Most High God. We are the only Jesus that that world out there is ever going to see. Is us. And the world needs to know that we serve a good God. A God that cares for us. A God that wants us healthy and wealthy and wise and peaceful. Good relationships. Huh? Well, how are they ever going to see that unless it's active in our lives? Thank you for that overwhelming response. All right. That wasn't my message. I, I'm just, you know, I, I've been with Brother Copeland for 35 years now. So you got to understand. If you, how many of you have ever been to a Kenneth Copeland Ministries meeting? Okay. So you know. It just goes on and on and on and on, you know. You know, the world doesn't have a clue. They do not have a clue about us. You know, you you tell somebody about the, you know, we just finished the the Southwest Believers Convention. Well, that's a six-day meeting. It starts at 9 in the morning and goes to whenever at night, 10.30 minimum. And 
You tell somebody about what are you doing this week? Well, I'm going downtown and we're going to have a meeting and we'll be there all day, every day for six days. And they think, you're going to do what? What do you all do in there all day? Huh? They don't understand. Never will understand. But that's all right. We understand. Hmm? We're growing and maturing and getting better at everything that we do. Isn't that right? Because we serve a good God. You know, we... Uh, oh, the world looks at people and they decide who are, who is great and who's not. Right? You know, and we... On Time Magazine, they have these pictures of these men who've done this, that, or the other, and so forth. But you know what? We were talking about Jesus. He's the greatest man in history. Not these rest, not the rest of these guys. Let me tell you something. Listen to this. In chemistry, he turned water into wine. Huh? In biology, he was born without normal conception. In physics, he overcame the law of gravity when he ascended into heaven. In economics, he overcame the law of diminishing supply by feeding the 5,000. In medicine, he cured the sick without a single dose of drugs. In history, he's the beginning and the end. In government, he shall be called Wonderful Counselor and Prince of Peace. In religion, he said, no one comes to the Father except through him. He had no servants, yet they called him Master. He had no degree, that they called him Teacher. He had no medicine, yet they called him Healer. He had no army, yet they feared him. He won no military battles, yet he conquered the world. Committed no crime, they crucified him. He was buried in a tomb, but he's not there anymore. Huh? The word says, if that same spirit, if that same spirit that went into hell and said enough and raised Jesus from the dead, if that spirit dwells in you, it'll quicken your mortal body. Do you know how much power it took to raise him from the dead? That same power is dwelling in you. Well, that's enough to get happy about right there. You're powerful people, people of authority. We just got to exercise it. He's the greatest man in history. Turn to Genesis 22. I'm going to talk about Abraham a little bit here. Abraham was cool. I can relate to Abraham. I'm 74. Brother Copeland's 80, and I'm running hard as I can to keep up with him. Now, y'all are going to come down to Anaheim, right? That's one, two, three. Now, we're coming all the way out here. I'm, I'm originally from Mark Tree, Arkansas. That's the usual response I get when I say I'm from Mark Tree, Arkansas. <laughs> Little bitty town in Arkansas, out in cotton country, you know, just big snakes and big mosquitoes. That's all we had out there. But back in Arkansas, we had this tradition. It's called turnabout is fair play. Y'all have that tradition in Australia? You don't know because you don't know what it is, right? Well, let me explain it to you. Back in Arkansas, if you came over and visited us, we had a good time of fellowship and enjoyed one another's company. And you go home. Well, the next time we get together, it is my turn to come see you. So turn about is fair play, right? Right? Now, look, see, we've got this imagination, right? You can be anywhere you want to be anytime you want to go. Now, I'm looking out here at you, and you can be sitting there with a smile on your face and your eyes are open, but you're not home. You've gone somewhere. Huh? Now, you ladies know this very well, right? Husband comes home at night, and you're sitting there, and you're telling him everything that happened during your day, and he says, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. He's smiling that he's not home. 
He's doing something. He's working in the garage. He's gone fishing. He's somewhere. You can go anywhere you want to today, but stay here. Okay? Stay here. Because I'm believing that I will say something that will help you today. That's why I'm here. I could be anywhere in the world I want to be. And I am. Right here. So stay here with me, okay? So whenever I pause a little bit, that's your opportunity. Say, yes, amen, Brother Barry. Just checking. So back in Mark 3, we've got this turnabout as fair play, right? So I've come to see you. So well, now you've got to come see me, right? That's fair. I live in Fort Worth, Texas. We've got a ministry there. I'll even buy your lunch. How about that? That's a deal, isn't it? That's worth the trip. All right, all right. Next weekend, I'll be down in Anaheim. Not quite as far as Fort Worth. So you can come see me then. Well, so you got excited about that too. All right, I'll bring Brother Copeland with me. How about that? <laughs> so you come down and see us. I don't know what he's going to preach, but I can tell you one thing. It'll be good. Hmm? It'll build your faith. And you know as well as I do, just one word from God, change your life forever. Already has and it'll continue to do so. Genesis chapter 22. This gives an account of Abraham. Now you know this account where Abraham believed God for a son and Sarah of course she was beyond being childbearing age and she was barren even when she was young and yet she believed the promise Now we were talking about the promises just a few minutes ago she believed the promise and focused on the promise more than she did her own body and changed her mind because you, if you recall originally when they were out there talking about uh, what was going to happen and the angels were visiting Abraham and they said about nine months we're going to come back through here and Sarah's going to have a child and she was listening at the tent door because she was inside and they were outside and she laughed Isn't that right she laughed now, she didn't laugh out loud because she didn't want them to know that she was listening. But she laughed because she looked at the natural circumstances and it looked absolutely impossible. Hmm? Because of their age, because of all of the things that would have to be overcome for this to take place. But when she started thinking about it, she changed her mind. And that baby, that promise, became more important to her than the circumstances. And we're the same way. When these promises become greater in our focus, when we start looking at these promises and focusing on these promises, they will become greater because what you focus on expands. And we'll overcome whatever the situation and circumstance is and see the promise of God fulfilled in our lives just like she did because about nine months later she had a baby a baby son what they had always wanted well he grows up he's a young man now and you know the thing about God if he's asking you to do something if you think God's asking you to do something and you can do it it's not God he never asked you to do the possible he only asked you to do the impossible but whenever he asks you to do something and you do it, he'll be back. And he'll ask you to do something just a little bit greater than what you did before. Continuing to stretch your faith. You know, the word says we move from faith to faith and glory to glory. We're all on that path, changing from one phase to another in our lives. Hmm? God doesn't change, but he expects us to. I got this little plaque on my desk, and it says, when you're through changing... You're through. So we continued to change. Well, he came back to Abraham and he said, 
in uh, chapter 22, the verse first, it says, And it came to pass after these things that God did tempt Abraham. Now, we don't, we don't like to talk about that too much, God tempting us, you know. We, we, liked, we like the good, happy verses. But there's always a test. If you want to be promoted, you have to be proven. And you're proven during the test. So he come back to Abraham, said he tests Abraham, said to him, Abraham, he said, behold, here I am. He said, take now thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah. Offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains which I'll tell thee of. Now, one of the things we have to do when we're reading the Bible is recognize these are real people just like you, just like me, they think, they feel, they hurt, they have opportunities to overcome just like we do. Not one bit of difference. So can you imagine, God comes to Abraham, here's this son that he's believed for 25 years. I mean, we think we've done something if we believe for 25 minutes and some, before something comes, you, you know, before it's manifest. 25 years he believed for this son. The son's finally manifest. He's raising him. And now God comes back and says, I want you to take him up on the mountain and sacrifice him. Well, how dumb is this? It's through the son that the promise is going to be realized. So it makes no sense. Now, I got a clue for you. God will never make any sense. Huh? He's not logical. That's one of the issues that I had. I have a degree in biology, a minor in psychology. I mean, I had it all worked out. Hmm? I had a plan. But you know what? There came a point in time when my plan wasn't working. That's the time to get a new plan. God has a plan for your life. You need to find out what it is and get in it. Because that's where the blessing is. On that path of obedience. That's where the blessing is. God prepares, God precedes, and God provides. It's all, your provision's already out there, but it's on the path of obedience. If you're over here doing your own thing, your own plan, he's not obligated to bless that. That was a pause there in case you missed it. He said, Take thy son, thine only son Isaac, if thou lovest, get thee into the land of Moriah, offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains which I'll tell thee of. Now, the thing about Abraham is, he didn't get on the phone, call his neighbors, say, Well, now, I think I heard from God here on something, and uh, he's talking to me about taking my son up on the mountain and sacrificing him. No, he didn't do that. He didn't call a committee meeting and share with everybody what he thought God was telling him to do. It says that he immediately, he got up early in the morning. Hmm? See, he got up and got about what God was asking him to do. The longer you wait from the time that God tells you to do something and actually start to do it, the more likely you will be not to do it. Opportunities to find excuses and not do what God's called you to do. Abraham rose up early in the morning. Saddle his ass, took two of his young men with him, Isaac his son, clave the wood for the burnt offering, rose up, and went to the place of which God had told him. He got up and got about what God had called him to do. God had asked him to do. Then on the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place afar off. And Abraham said to his young men, now listen to this. Abide ye here with the ass, and I and the lad, listen to what he's saying here. I and the lad will go yonder and worship and come again to you. That's faith. He said, the boy and I are going to go up and the boy and I are going to come back. Now, he, he, he knows full well what he's been asked to do. Take his son up on the mountain and sacrifice. You know what sacrifice means? That means he's going to kill him. Huh? And yet he's saying... No matter, and we know this from Hebrews, it says that he was fully persuaded that if God had to raise him from the dead, he would do it. 
See, we've got to be fully persuaded just like Abraham. We've got to be fully persuaded that God will do what he says he will do. Hmm? He was fully persuaded. You know the key to persuasion? Repetition. God changed Abraham's name. So that every time he heard his name, Father of many nations, Father of many nations, Father of many nations, every time he heard his name, Father of many nations, and he believed he would be the Father of many nations. Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering, laid it upon Isaac, his son, took the fire in his hand, and a knife. Now think about this. What if it was your child? God said, I want you to sacrifice him. This is not an easy thing to do. But you're proven for promotion. This is a test. God's asked him to do something. He's waiting to see if he'll really do it. God asked you to do things. He wants to know, will you really do it? Hmm? Then Isaac speaks up. Now, he's a young man. He's seen sacrifices before. He knows how this works. And he said to his dad, he said, Father, he said, here I am, I am my son. He said, now, I see the fire. I see the wood. But uh, I don't see any lamb. The light's coming on. He's seeing that he is it. And Abraham said, my son, now here's what I want you to hear out of everything I have to say today. This is key. This is what I want you to focus on. He said, my son, God will provide. God will provide. We have to believe that. No matter where you are, no matter what's going on in your life, God will provide. Now, I told you I'm from Mark Tree, Arkansas. You remember that? One does. What about the rest of you? Did y'all leave? No, oh, okay. I was raised by my grandmother. My dad was killed in the Second World War. And in those days, uh, if uh, your family was around, that's who you were taken to. And my mother had to go off to work, so she left me with my grandmother. And she raised me until I was 13. Now, my grandmother was a disciplinarian. You know what that means? That means spare the rod and spoil the child. Hmm? I was not spoiled. But there's one thing that I knew. Before the strap came out, that's what she used on me. Now, today that would be child abuse, I know. But nevertheless, I survived it. There is something that she would do. She would bring her finger out. And she'd say, Barry. And when she talked to me like that and that finger was out, I knew. Better listen. Better listen. Because what's coming next is not going to be pleasant. See, what we have to understand and what we have to believe is that God will provide for me. It's not good enough just to read this word and say, well, God will provide, provide for Abraham. No. It's not enough to believe that God will provide for the pastor. God will provide for Brother Copeland. God will provide for me. God for, will provide for the twins. No. You've got to understand and believe that God will provide for you. You've got to make this personal. This book was written to you personally. So you've got to receive it that way. Amen? So... Here's what I want you to do. I want to get your finger up. Put your finger up. And we're going to say this. If you really believe it, hmm, here's what I want you to do. Say this after me. God will provide for 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 me. Now, you're going to have opportunities coming up this week. You leave here. I mean, you know, we come in here, we sing, we praise the Lord, hallelujah, everybody's beautiful, smiling, happy. That's great. But here in a little while, 
And you may be saying, soon I hope, you're going to go back out there. That's where you're going to need this. Hmm? Because you're going to have opportunities. You're going to come up against something. And when you do, this is what I want you to remember out of today. Whatever it may be, you get your finger up and you speak to it. And say, God will provide for me. I don't care how many times you have to say it. You say it until you believe it. That's the power of confession. Abraham was fully persuaded because he repeated what God said about him over and over and over. And it's not to move God, it's to move us. He said, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. So they went both of them together. You know the interesting thing about this? Isaac didn't say another word. Not another word. You know why? He believed his dad. Hmm? He'd seen his dad operate in faith before. He'd seen him say things before that didn't make sense, were illogical, and yet they came to pass. And after all, that's why God went to Abraham to begin with. You remember when he went to, to Ur of the Chaldees. You know where Ur of the Chaldees is? It's just on the other side of Mark Tree, Arkansas. He went down there. They're moon worshipers. Huh? If, if you were going to choose somebody to make a covenant with, would you go to moon worshipers? That doesn't make any sense, does it? But see, God doesn't look on the outside. He looks on the inside. And he looked at Abraham, and he looked on the inside, looked at his heart, and he saw potential. He saw a man there that where it would raise his children up in the way they should go. And that's exactly what he did. He raised Abraham up to know God, to know faith, and he set the example for him. That's why when it came, I mean, he's a young man. His age or thereabouts. How many young men do you know today that if their dad took them up on the mountain and they knew they were about to be slain, that they would just quietly lay down on the wood and say, okay, here I am. Hmm? It takes faith. Isaac was full of faith just like Abraham was. And they came to the place which God had told him of. Abraham built an altar there, laid the wood in order, bound Isaac his son, laid him in the altar upon the wood, and stretched forth his hand and took the knife to slay his son. He's going to do this. He's got the knife up ready to plunge it into his son. And the angel of the Lord called to him out of heaven. Don't you know that was a welcome sound? Hmm? Called him out of heaven and said, Abraham. He said, Yes, Lord, here I am. He said, Lay not thine hand upon the lad, neither do thou anything to him, for now I know. See, here's the test. Abraham had passed the test. Now I know that you fear me, seeing thou hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, from me. This is what this is all about. God wants to be number one in your life hmm? above everything else. You love your children. Abraham loved his child, and he was a child of, of the promise. He was the one through which all of these many nations were going to come. You could see how easy it would be to take him and elevate him, serve him. Before long, he's elevated above God. So God comes down and says, Here's a test for you. But he passed the test. Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. Abraham went, took the ram, offered him up for a burnt offering instead of his son. Let me ask you a question. You think that ram was born in that bush? No. So where was this ram three days ago when they started on this journey? Well, he's out there doing what rams do, right? Munching a little grass, roaming around. And then God comes to him. You know, God can talk to animals. Hmm? 
How do you think all those animals got in that ark when Noah was building the ark? Noah wasn't out there running around trying to catch one here, catch one there. Oh, wrong kind, get another one. Huh? No, God called them in there. And the thing about animals is they just do what God tells them to do. They don't argue about it. Don't come up with a better idea. They just do what God calls them to do. So he said, Mr. Ram, I need you to go north. And when you get to this mountain, I want you to go up on top of this mountain. And up on top of this mountain, ooh, there's some grass there. Mm, mm, mm. It's better than anything you have ever tasted. So Mr. Ram goes north. He gets to the mountain. He's going up the mountain. Now get the picture. Abraham and Isaac are going up one side of the mountain. And Mr. Ram is going up the other. Does Abraham see the ram? No. He doesn't know the ram is there. All he knows is God will provide. He gets to the top of the mountain, and the instant that the need arises, the provision is there. Hmm? That's faith. That's where we are. We're believing for the provision. We're believing that God will provide for me. We don't see it, but it's out there. If we're on that path of obedience, if we're doing what God's called us to do, we're on the path of obedience. That's where the blessing is. That's where the provision is. So we have to stay on the path of obedience. That's what Abraham was doing. Abraham called the name of that place Jehovah Jireh. It is said to this day, in the mount of the Lord it shall be seen. And the angel of the Lord called to Abraham out of heaven a second time and said, By myself have I sworn, saith the Lord, for because thou hast done this thing and hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, that in blessing I will bless thee. Obedience precedes the blessing. And in multiplying, I'll multiply thy seed to the stars of the heaven, and as the sand which is upon the seashore. And thy seed shall possess the gate of his enemies. And in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. We are sitting here today blessed because Abraham was obedient way back when. Huh? Now God's asking you to do things. Now we don't know what the purpose of it may be. But there is a purpose. There's a reason that God's asking you to do things. And the long-term benefits, just like with Abraham, we don't know. But God knows. That's why we need to be... And it has to be a big thing. He starts with small things. Maybe it's going across the street and being a blessing to the neighbor. Hmm? That's not a big thing. But as you're obedient to do that, he'll tell you other things to do. And it'll continue to grow. Because we're blessed to be a blessing. Amen? And in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, because thou hast obeyed my voice. Let's turn to John... 14. Verse 1 says, Let not your heart be troubled. And Today, we have lots of opportunities to have our heart be troubled. Hmm? When you look around the world and all the stuff that's going on, back in my state of Texas, down south, Houston, Beaumont, in Louisiana, there's a lot of hearts that are troubled down there. But what an opportunity for the church. Hmm? When these occasions occur, what an opportunity for the church. And I'm telling you, the church is alive and well down there. The EMIC is involved. We've been going down. We send volunteers down. We're sending food and, and, and supplies down there. And many, many others are. 
when you see, you, you know, you, hopefully you don't watch too much of the news, but if you do, you see all of the things that we're being told about this country. It's not true. It's not true. Just like Chris was telling us earlier. And I travel internationally. I got about three mile, three million miles on American Airlines, so I do a lot of traveling. I go internationally, and I see the news that is reported over there compared to the news that is report, reported over here. But you can't believe that stuff, huh? They will lie to you. The people in this country, whenever there's a crisis, just like what we've had in Houston, in that area down there. I'm telling you, they will arise to the occasion. Hmm? They rise to the occasion. I mean, we, we had people packing up their boats and filling them up with every kind of, of things that you can think of heading off down to Houston. Volunteers. Isn't it amazing? Somebody, they don't have to go do this, but they will take what they have, go down there to help somebody else who's in need. Hmm? put themselves in harm away. How much more should we be doing since we are in the body of Christ? Hmm? Don't let your heart be troubled. In other words, you can control it. How do you do that? Stay focused on God's Word instead of what all these other people are saying. See, what other people say about you has no consequence whatsoever in your life. It's what you say about you that matters. Even God won't overrule what you say about you. Hmm? I mean, just think about it. We know what the Word says. If you believe in your heart, confess with your mouth that Jesus is uh, the Son of God, you'll be saved. But if you say, no, I don't believe that, you won't be saved. It's your Word. It's what you confess. That's what matters. So don't pay any attention to anybody else. Just pay attention to what you have to say and say things that are in line with God's Word. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. And I go to prepare a place for you. Isn't that good? Hmm? Jesus is preparing a place for us. But you know, back in Mark Tree, Arkansas... It's interesting. My grandmother, she didn't go to church, but she sent me to church. Parents are that way. They might not come to church, but they send their kids to church because they know there's something there that they need. So she sent me to this church. We had this little bitty church that's right next door to our house. It was the Church of God of Prophecy. I don't know if you're familiar with them or not, but they wrote the book on Holy Roller. And I was, you know, I don't know, eight, nine, something like that. And I go over to this. It's just one little room with a big potbelly stove in the middle of it. And I'm telling you, this, this preacher, I mean, he's spitting and he's uh, going at it. And, you know, it's hellfire and damnation, you know, and trying to scare everybody into the kingdom. You know, that stuff doesn't work. It's the goodness of God that draws people to him, not the fear. But anyway, I mean, they're good people. Don't get me wrong. They're good people. But I was looking around there, and I'm hearing all of this, and I'm looking out in the parking lot, and here's all these cars out there. And none of these cars are all the same color. Because what they do is, if you bend a fender on a car, they just go down to the salvage yard and find one like it, take the fender off, and put on the new fender. Whether it's the same color or not doesn't matter. And I'm thinking, you know, he's up there, he's preaching, oh, you just got to suffer through. Just got to get through this old life. But somewhere over there in the sweet by and by, oh, everything's going to be better over there. No more crying over there. Streets of gold up there. And I'm sitting there thinking, but I'm not there. I'm here. I'd like to have my money now. I'd like to have healing in my body now. I'd like to have peace in my heart now. Well, it was 1969 before I heard a man speak and say, you can have it now. And his name was Kenneth Copeland. My mother-in-love 
Now, you may have a mother-in-law, but I had a mother-in-love. Now, she had an incentive to take me there because when I married my wife, I was not born again. My wife was very born again. But my mother-in-love figured out pretty quick that if something didn't happen to me, her daughter was in deep trouble. So the women got together and they started praying for me. Now, here's a clue, men. If the women get together and start praying for you, just give up. It's over. So I got born again. But my mother-in-law also knew that there's more to just being born again. And this is so true. You know this. You're born again. Now you just have the opportunity. You have a choice. But that's where Romans 12, 2 comes into the picture. Now you've got to start renewing your mind to what the truth is about life. And all that stuff that I heard in Mark Cree, Arkansas, was not true. So she started taking me to these meetings. The first meeting she ever took me to after I was born again was in a little bitty room. It was near this size and maybe this many people. And there was a guy standing up there, and he was saying, here's what God's done in my life, and he'll do it for you too. You can be, a, you can be prosperous and be a Christian. That was a revelation to me because I'd never heard that. How many years have we wandered around in ignorance, not knowing the Word, not knowing the truth of God's Word that He will provide for us? Well, I picked up on that. I mean, hell, fire, and damnation, all that sort of thing, that didn't bring me to God. But that Word that God is a good God, that he cared for me, that he wanted me to have peace in my heart, good relationships, and he had a plan for my life. Man, that's what drew me to God. And so that was my introduction to Brother Copeland. Now, little did I know that years later, you know, you can look back on your life and you just see how God was moving you around, getting you in the right place, usually through the efforts of somebody else so that you could receive the word, so you could receive the truth, so your life could be changed for the better. Hmm? Well, if other people did that for us, shouldn't we be doing the same thing for others? Hmm? That's why we're blessed, to be a blessing. So I picked up on the word and changed our lives. Now, my, my wife was Southern Baptist to the core, Okay? I don't have anything against Southern Baptist, okay? It's all right. But her mother came back from Texas speaking in tongues. Her husband was a deacon in the First Baptist Church. How I many of you know that will create an issue? Was not understood or well received. So... Out they go from the First Baptist Church. But my mother-in-law, she knew the truth. She knew there was more, and she wanted more. And she wouldn't give up on it. So if she got me, she knew that I needed more too. So what do I know? See, I, I'm 150% world. I, I don't know anything about religion. I don't know anything about any of this stuff. All I've been told is God wants to bless you. And I picked up on that. So she said, well, you need to get filled with the Holy Ghost. Okay. No problem. So I did. Now my wife, I go home and I say, listen to this, and start speaking in tongues. And she was not impressed. But you know what opened her up and changed her to receiving the Holy Spirit, which she did eventually, is she started seeing changes in my life. Hmm? That's what impresses other people, the Lord working in your life. That's the way I started today, saying that you are obligated to live a good life, live an abundant life. Now, we're all in the process. We're all moving along that path at different levels. But if we're making progress, that's the main thing. But we've got to continue to put forth the effort. Amen? So don't let your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe in Jesus. And know he's preparing a place for you.
and he's going to come again. Hmm? He's coming again. I mean, that's something to get excited about. Huh? We're going to be with him forever. Rule and reign. Kings and priests. All of these things that God has in store for us. If we'll just stay centered on what he has to say and focused on his word. Amen? All right, stand with me if you will. We're going to pray and we're going to say something just to get it ingrained in your brain, in your mind, because you're going to need it. Get your finger up. You remember what I said? God will provide for me. God will provide for me. God will provide for me. You got to say it like you mean it. Huh? See, the excitement that's inside's got to get out. And the way you talk makes all the difference. You got to talk like you're convinced that this is going to work. When you talk to other people, you've got to speak with confidence about God's Word, about God, about Jesus. Confidence. Hmm? Let's say this with confidence. God will provide for me. God will provide for me. God will provide for me. Amen. Now, now you can go out of here. And face whatever it is to face out there because all you know, all you got to do is get your finger up and say, God will provide for me, whatever the situation is, whatever has to be overcome. You know, we're, we're overcome. We're more than overcomers. Huh? Let me tell you what more than an overcomer is. Y'all have boxing down in Australia, don't you? Okay. So these two guys, they get in a ring, right? And they're duking it out. One guy finally knocks the other one out. He gets a big check, right? He's the winner. He goes home, his wife takes the check. She's more than an overcomer. Huh? She didn't have to get up at 4 or 5 a.m. and go out there and do all the running, all the training, get in the the ring and spar with somebody and do all of that stuff. She didn't have to get in the ring, get knocked around and get a black eye or a broken nose. None of that. She just got the check. Huh? Jesus has already fought the battle. We don't have to fight that battle. And he's given the check to us. Amen? All we have to do is put forth the effort to receive it and take it and resist the enemy, and he'll flee from us. Amen? Amen. Father, we thank you for this time together today. We thank you for the word. We thank you, Lord, that this word will not return to you void, but it will accomplish that which you sent it forth to do, and that is to build faith in the hearts of your people. Lord, we thank you so much that you are our provider. And whatever our needs are, you have already provided for those needs. You knew them long before we ever did. So we just receive it as done now and expect it to be manifest in the physical. Lord, I speak healing to anybody that is in the sound of my voice. If you need healing in your bodies, receive it now. Father, I thank you that every need is met above and beyond what we could ask or think whether it's financial need or any other type of need, already done because you've promised it in your word. So, Lord, we thank you for this now. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Back to you, Pastor. Amen. Amen. Did you receive that today? Say, I receive it. God will provide for me. Right? So we have, you can be seated. We have an opportunity to sow some seed. And uh, we're going we're gonna, to uh, bless Brother Barry because of the word. That, I mean, that was a good word. I needed to hear that word. Did you need to hear that word? That's right. And so we needed to hear that word. And so I just, you know, want to give you an opportunity to sow into him and to, into what he's doing, right? It's a privilege and it's an honor. Second Corinthians 9, 8 in the message says, God can pour on the blessings in astonishing ways so that you're ready for anything and everything more than just ready to do what needs to be done. That's what I want to be. I want to be ready 
for anything more than enough, more than just what needs to be done so that I can be blessed to be a blessing. So now you have an opportunity. You're blessed. I know all of you. And now we have an opportunity to be a blessing. Amen? Amen. So let's pray. Father, we just come to you and we plead the blood of Jesus over this offering. And God, that it will accomplish as we sow our seed today, that it will have a mission and it will accomplish what it's sent to do. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Okay, so um, you can make your checks out to Word of Life and we'll give... Um, brother Barry one check and so just make make the checks out to word of life and we'll just bless him so wasn't that a good word today praise God all right so living victory is this next week anybody want to raise their hand and sh- tell me that you're going to be coming down to Anaheim I'll be there I looked I look forward to seeing you down there uh, it's going to be a good time. It's good word. So it's Thursday night, and it's all day Friday. And I realize that some of you work during the day, and then it's Friday night. But come on down. And, oh, excuse me. It's all day. It's Friday night and then Saturday morning, right? All day Friday? All day Friday. Let me get my facts straight. All day Friday and then Saturday morning. So come on Saturday morning and come on Friday night. And let me see you. Make sure you say hi to me. And I'm sure if you see Brother Barry and you say hi to him, he'll say hi back. Right? (laughs) Okay. All right. God's a good God. All right. Well, all right, you guys. You guys are blessed, and we're going to pray you out. And, And, Father, I just pray and plead the blood of Jesus over every person here today, God, and over their week. And, Lord, I know that many people face challenges, but, God... We know that you have given us the ability to speak to that mountain and it will be removed in the name of Jesus. And so, Father, I just pray for each one that they get that confidence of God living on the inside of them. Father, that each one of us that will know that our God is, is, is working for us. Our God is, is moving for us. Our God goes before us. And Lord, if we know that, there is nothing that we can can't do. And Father, I just pray right now that there are no limitations in our thinking this week, that all limitations are off, that we believe (laughs) that you can do above and beyond what we can think or imagine. And we give you all the praise and we give you all the glory and the people of the Lord said, amen.